Thank you for coming to Mammoth Copyright Issues on the Internet. Um, it could be Mammoth colon Copyright Issues on the Internet or just very, very large copyright issues. But uh, the subject matter tells a story. So this is all about when the Sun, uh, the backstory, when the Sun published footage of a mammoth in Siberia, the story went viral. Uh, not surprisingly, it was a hoax, but it, uh, it was created using stolen documentary footage. Uh, the filmmaker uh, whose footage was taken fought back via the internet and he gained uh, international publicity, um, not only for that, but for the footage that it was actually intended for originally. So we need the internet to promote our projects. Um, how do we protect them? Um, how do we stop theft? And at least get the perpetrators to pay? And what about the, men the money generated through advertising? Something has to change, apparently. Uh, but how and when? So um, just before we kick off, I can just about see you. Can I have a show of hands to see <coughs> how many of you are producers? So, okay, a couple. Any broadcasters? Um, so the others. So you are, you're involved in documentary production. You're journalists? No. All right, then. Uh, vegetarians? Geminis? <laughs> Tottenham fans? No. All right. Well, um, okay, we can put the lights back down there. That worked well. Um, how many... Ha all right, another show of hands. How many of you uh, worry about um, the internet being a place where you're not quite sure what's going to happen to your content? Okay. Oh, that's good. Thanks. Um, and how many of you are sure of the legal standpoint? How many of you are unsure of the legal standpoint? Yeah, great. Okay, good. All right, that's great. Thanks, Thanks for the interaction. I won't ask for too, many, too much more of that. I'll go on now to introduce the panel. Uh, and it's a fantastically diverse panel. I think uh, a lot of questions will come through from this. So feel free to interject all the way through if you want to. And at the end, we'll leave some time as well. Uh, so... Uh, starting to my left, uh, we have Stuart Jackson. He's a partner at Kempner and Partners, specialises in intellectual property law and advises both on licensing and enforcing rights in all types of intellectual property, including patents, trademarks, copyright, design right and confidential information. His work has also recently resulted in a leading case on malicious falsehood in which the English Court of Appeal made a significant change to the law his clients range from major, major multinational corporations to creative individuals, and he only lives up the road as well, which is good. Uh, he started as a chemist, believe it or not, and uh, has trained as a beer scientist, I'm led to believe. A beer taster. A beer taster. Okay, so a uh, man of many talents. Uh, Kate Quilton here on my left is the multi-platform commissioning editor at Channel 4, Factual. Or Factual at Channel 4. That's right, isn't it? <laughs> Uh, started out as a broadcast journalist, Kate worked at ITV and the BBC before heading out to Channel 4. A specialist in social media, she launched Channel 4 on YouTube and Bebo and MSN and has recently worked on interactive reality formats. Her latest projects include the Food Hospital, featuring the first online food science trials as a part of a broadcast programme, as, as part of a broadcast programme, and Hippo, Wild Feast Live, which brought the African food chain to life through round-the-clock live streaming. And more recently, Fox is Live, which was one of my personal favourites. And that's nothing to do with the band that she was in, apparently, in the old days. <laughs> so, um, OK, that was, the, so that was worth it, wasn't it, that joke? Uh, then we've got Lou Petho, who we just mentioned, um, an independent documentary filmmaker and cinematographer with over 30 years' experience. Through the 1980s, he worked as a cameraman and director on a variety of television programmes and corporate and advertising before focusing on documentaries for the mid-90s. In 2003, he won a Banff Rocky Award for Ted's Evolution. He took part in Documentary Campus in 2009 and is currently working on a history documentary, Escape from Siberia. And as you'll hear from his accent, he's French and lives in Thailand, but there is an Australian connection there as well, which we'll, uh, we'll hear as soon as he opens his mouth. Um, and then we have uh, Sam Barcroft, founder and MD of Barcroft Media Group of Companies, representing millions of images and thousands of hours of footage of, of editorial content for freelancers. Also makes docs for Channel 5 and Discovery, and there's one coming up next week on Channel 5. It's the extraordinary people slot, uh, A Boy Called Fish. Um, so he works in both short-form and long-form programming. Uh, and then finally, Jamie Searle has worked in digital media at companies including Universal Music, and, and uh, uh, Universal Pictures, and Base 79, 
where uh, Base79 is a commercial partner of YouTube and their largest European partner. A strong knowledge of digital rights and licensing both in music and the film TV world. His background as a recording artist in a punk band, or fresh metal as we're now led to believe, is a new band. <laughs> uh, with countless live performances and a top ten single under his belt, so that's good. Provides him with a unique understanding of rights from niche business and the SME perspective. So um, with all that done, let's, I'll pass over to Lou to talk about his, uh, uh, his case. So over to you, Lou. Thank sure. you. Sure. Just play a bit of footage for you. So, about this time last year, I posted this clip along with a number of other clips, and it was part of a research trip uh, that I did for a documentary, as uh, Paul mentioned, called Escape from Siberia, where I planned to uh, retrace my grandfather's escape from a POW camp in 1915 and his walk home to Budapest. Now, the footage just set up there and uh, didn't do too much. And then on the 8th of February of this year, a uh, UK paper brought up this story, Woolly Mammoth Spotted in Siberia. Um, the journalist or the reporter, Michael Cohen, who, uh, who, who presented the article, also, also had a bit of footage, which he claimed was given to him or he acquired it from some uh, engineers in the, um, working inside Siberia. Now, as you can imagine, this, this thing went viral. It, uh, it was very big, it was mammoth. And it came to the attention of a person called Moderate Martian, uh, and he considers himself as a uh, hoax buster. And what he did, he saw the names on the footage and he thought, yeah, something's a bit odd here. Michael Cohen in the uh, paranormal world, he considers himself as a paranormal reporter. Um, is seen as somebody that comes up with a lot of this material. And what Moderate Martian did, he did a search for Siberian River and then came across my footage on the third page. He emailed me and said, look, I think something's, I think somebody's taken your footage. <coughs> I checked it, thought it was, so I tried to contact the Sun. I went to their uh, blog, I uh, sent them a uh, email and said, uh, I'm the guy who, who took this footage, here's a link to my original footage. I told them that I saw lots of wildlife out there, but I just can't remember seeing a mammoth. They then put my comment up on the blog, which I thought was a bit odd, so I reposted it. It never went up. Um, I tried to get in touch with their news department, yeah, and there was no response. So I was starting to get a bit, you know, get a bit edgy. So I started to email the same message to a number of the other publishers. And remember, this thing went viral. I think it was several, you might know a bit more, but in the millions of hits within a few days. Um, so I sent it to uh, people like the ABC in America and Huffington Post, and they were interested. They were more interested, though, with the video response that I made, because I, I felt that this was an internet thing, and I should respond through the internet. I really didn't know my position as far as the legal system was, and I also found it as an opportunity maybe to promote my my, video, uh, my project Escape from Siberia. So just remember I was pretty pissed off when, when I uh, posted this footage. G'day everyone, my name is Lou Petho and on the weekend I was alerted to the fact that a character by the name of Michael Cohen took hold of some of my footage without knowing it and created an elaborate hoax uh, on the general public. What they did is they took this scene of a river in the Cyan Mountains in Siberia, and then, through CGI, I, I imagine, created a woolly mammoth crossing the river. I did not give them permission to do this. Not only that, they plastered their own copyright over the footage, my footage, and I assume made a profit by selling it on to news agencies throughout the world. Now, if it was a couple of kids in a bedroom having a bit of a laugh. I'd, I'd laugh along with them. I think it'd be great. But this is a couple of, I assume, business people, production companies. I mean, guys, what the... You're stealing, taking people's footage, creating a lie with it. I assume made a profit by selling it to the media organisations around the world. Now, I'm not much of a legal person, so I'm 
calling out to if there's anybody out there who's interested in pursuing this to see how far we can take it, please get in touch with me. Now, if you're interested, um, the footage was shot, as I said, in the Cyan Mountains. The river is called the Kitoi River, and uh, it's quite a wild area, hard, hard, well, a little hard to get into. It took me about five days. And that was probably because I was carrying uh, maybe too much gear and uh, got lost for a day. But, but stunning country, beautiful country. It was done as part of a documentary project that I'm working on following my grandfather who escaped from a Siberian POW camp and then walked home to Budapest in 1918. And um, yeah, look, if you're interested in, in any of that information, there's a few links below. And please, if you've got a legal mind, please get in touch with me. Thank you. Now you probably noticed at the beginning there's a, there's a little bit of a, a dissolve um, because I managed to get in touch with um, Barcroft Media and they explained to me that uh, though they had their name as copyright, they were actually working through uh, Michael Cohen, I mean, Sam will explain it a bit more, but uh, was a was providing the footage and that he also signed a contract to say that he owned the copyright. So Sam. Um, okay. Yeah, so um, it was a bit of a difficult situation. Um, my background is that I was for some years a freelance photojournalist and so um, my empathy and sympathy lies squarely with anybody who's um, trekked over mountains and uh, spent their own money to get themselves to somewhere to make something um, editorially interesting. Um, so this was quite a difficult situation for us because our company um, represents the work of lots of freelance uh, videographers, journalists, photographers um, and producers. And um, it was pretty tough to be um, confronted with the idea that A, something that we had distributed in good faith on behalf of a contributor might not have been theirs, but much more for us, that B, it might actually have been fabricated um, as a news company. Um, we're very, very sharp on trying to make sure we only put out accurate information um, to our customers. So it was a shock to us, and I'm really glad to say that Lou and us have now kind of worked through this and um, come to an amicable arrangement financially. Say and everything as well, else. I mean, how resourceful is this guy that ripped it off to actually find, he actually found a river in Siberia. I mean, you know, why did he go to all that trouble? Um, if he was going to do a hoax, um, do it on any old river, but he, he, tried, he actually tried to find a river in Siberia to, to put the hoax mammoth into as well. Well, the funny thing is that apparently he was a psychic before he was a um, paranormal researcher, so he probably should have stayed at his old job and seen this yeah. coming. <laughs> so um, I suppose from our point of view, um, what we were able to do was make sure that um, the footage was pulled and wasn't disseminated any further, which is always what any decent copyright company would do immediately if there is a problem around um, footage. Um, but obviously these things then have a life of their own. Um, and the big problem with uh, copyright on the internet is um, anybody is only one right click away from um, being able to steal somebody somebody's work and um, the fact that there's no physical barrier to stopping people from lifting work um, is a massive challenge for anybody that wants to earn some money out of their day's graft um, who's a creative um, so essentially from our point of view um, we were glad to resolve this and um, we're no longer accepting work from Michael Cohen because he breached his contract with us. Um, I was going to say, did you, did you go after him? Because um, Go after is an interesting um, phrase. Um, we've stopped working with him with immediate effect, um, yeah. I would say is the way of putting it. Um, but what's interesting, and the reason it slipped through our editorial um, safeguards um, was mainly because it was actually, as you've alluded to, quite well done, and to the naked eye, um, it actually appeared like it, uh, it wasn't fabricated footage. Um, and I think it's also, for anybody that might be watching this um, who's not au fait with the tabloid press um, and populist television in the UK, we do love a mystery. Mm. And um, it was quite interesting quite how many um, production companies came straight on to us wanting to license the footage as soon as it was uh, 
um, out there in the in the ether. So. Um, uh, an interesting case that caused us a little bit of shock and pain at the time, but I'm glad has now been um, put away. And I'd like to commend Lou on the way that um, he used um, his own voice and the power of the internet to actually resolve this in um, hopefully a positive way, because noise um, and standing up for yourself are the two biggest ways you can ensure your IP is protected um, in an area that isn't very heavy on assisting uh, people chasing copyright claims. Do you get many of these cases coming up? We've never had a case before um, where somebody has stolen somebody else's work and then fabricated some, uh, a new film out of it and then presented it to us as legitimate editorial content, as far as I'm aware. And so, um, like anything in life, the first time is often a bit daunting. Um, but it certainly enabled us to um, secure our safeguards. We had actually been offered a couple of things by Michael Cohen previous to that, some of which that we had put out, um, and also some of which we'd rejected because we felt that um, he couldn't prove um, that um, the, pr the kind of history of the work that he was offering us. Right, okay. Mm -hmm. Now, yeah. Forearmed as well now. So I Indeed, uh, uh, doors and closing and horse come to <laughs> yeah. mind. Um, before we get Jamie and Kate to put in their perspective on this as well, I think it'd be worth uh, to get Stuart's sort of um, from the outset, which might help you guys as well, judging from the show of hands. You know, um, the legal, where are we legally? Sure. Well, first of all, I think it's, it's very good that Lou and Sam, as between themselves, sorted things out without recourse to the law, and, and indeed we've, we've heard that Sam did with his supplier as well. It's, I, I might be doing myself out of, of work, but actually it's far better to resolve things without going through the courts if you possibly can. Nevertheless, it, it is useful, if not essential, to know what the law is so that you know what your position is, what your strengths are, and to be able to bargain. Now, we've all got, and I'm sure all of you have got some idea of what copyright is and what it means, but there are a lot of misconceptions out there, and I think it would be helpful just to go through some of the, the real basics as to what is the law. And what the law is, actually, is, is there. Um, that's the Copyright Designs and Patents Act 1988. That was is the original one. It's been amended on many occasions since, and so it's updated. Um, if you don't ask questions at the end, Stuart is going to read through all I shall. It's <laughs> 238 pages there. Um, I, I shall refrain from saying it would be a mammoth task to go through all that lot. So. <laughs> but it, it is all in there. Now, let's just go through very, very quickly, and I've got some s slides here. Um, are they up there? Yes, they are. Brilliant. Um, there you are. There's the start of it. I, I, I've got 3,428 slides going all the text. You don't have any other <laughs> sessions today, do you? <laughs> you brought your glasses, all, all of you. No, seriously. Um, copyright arises automatically. You don't have to do anything to, um, to register it or, or anything. Um, if you've created an original work, you've got, uh, you have got copyright. In certain types of works, literary, dramatical music works. You'll see the second line there, it includes films. Films, in this case, in includes video rec tape recordings and any other sort of recording by which um, a moving image can be uh, generated. And copyright, what it actually gives you, the owner of the copyright, uh, you can stop anybody else copying the work issuing copies to the public, uh, communicating or performing or showing them to the public, or broadcasting the work. Well, quite clearly here, somebody had uh, taken a work which was protected by copyright and had showed it to the public, and so that was infringing copyright. There's absolutely no question about that. Um, copyright and film... The film itself is protected by copyright. Uh, initially, the owners of the copyright are jointly the producer and the, the director. The producer is actually defined in the act. It's the, the person who makes the arrangements for the, the film to be made, which is often the person who puts up the money. Um, it, it can be a little bit hazy sometimes. 
and the director. The director is the person you might call the author. It's the one, like Lou, who had the creative input. He has uh, the con creative control of the end product. And that copyright, once it has arisen in the, the new work, lasts for a long time. It's actually rather complicated. It used to be 50 years from making the film, but uh, after a lot of lobbying from big film companies, it was extended, and now it's much longer. But it's rather complicated. It's the life of the director, the author of the screenplay, and the composer of the film's music, plus another 70 years after the 31st of December, after the last of those dies. So that, that can be a long time. It can also, if somebody wants to use uh, a piece of, of film, and you're wondering if it is in copyright, it can sometimes be difficult to determine whether copyright still subsists or not, or whether it's expired. There's also moral rights. Now, moral rights is a, a <coughs> slightly different thing. Um, the moral rights in uh, a work um, are first the right to be identified as the author or the director, in the case of a film, whenever it is shown, and secondly, the right to object to what is known as derogatory treatment. Now, derogatory treatment doesn't mean what you probably think it means. Uh, what it actually means, as it's used in the, in the law, is almost any change to it, adaptation. Certainly what was done to Lou's work by adding on adding a, a, an image of, of a mammoth in it was derogatory treatment for the purposes of the law. There's no question about that. But it could have been something far more minor. Any change, almost, without the permission of the copyright owner can be derogatory. In, in a piece of music, for example, simply making a new arrangement of the music is derogatory treatment. Now, why this matters is because the... Um, moral rights cannot be assigned. So that they own, are owned by and will always be owned by the individual who uh, created the work and then after he dies for the next 70 years by his estate. Um, but the copyright can be assigned. So Lou could have assigned his copyright to me or to, to anybody else, but he would always have the, the moral rights. So that could mean that two people could be affected and two people could take action to do something about a misuse of a work. Um, very, very quickly, just a, another case which uh, did come to court. Uh, it was in the uh, court in England, the Patterns County Court, it's called, which does things really quite quickly and cheaply. Uh, this was over, you may have heard of it, somebody was skydive over Everest. Somebody, uh, it was somebody, it was a, a Danish man by the name of Per Wimmer, if I pronounce his name right, it was a bit of a, um, uh, a, a, a sort of um, uh, a character who liked a, a lot of publicity and a Richard Branson type sort of person who had some money. He wanted to make a tandem um, skydive over Everest. He arranged for a cameraman to take some film footage and they never bothered to say who was going to own the rights in it. And what happened afterwards was that one of them, the uh, the the person who set the whole thing up and wanted to do the skydive made a tele television program that was broadcast in Denmark, and the cameraman put up his uh, footage uh, on, the, on, on YouTube. And both of them decided that uh, they were infringing the copyright because both of them believed that they owned copyright in the work. So what happened in the end, the, uh, the judge did a sort of a judgment of Solomon and said, well, actually... You, Mr. Wimmer, are the producer, and you, Mr. Slater, the cameraman, are the director, so you both own copyright jointly, and because neither of you gave permission to the other, you're both infringing each other's works, each other's rights. <coughs> so go and fight it out. Um, what happens in the case of an internet here, what, what you should do, the very first thing, as, as Lou did, is to go and complain, not just because it makes you feel better, although it probably does, but by complaining, you draw that to the attention of whoever is hosting that. Um, you, you complain to the in internet service provider and to anybody else that you can who has any control over it. And because prior to having knowledge that there's uh, something infringing on the, the website, the, the ISP is 
is, is free of liability. As soon as he knows, then he can be liable. And so to complain and make your point there is the very first thing to do. In principle, that infringing material should then quickly be removed. In the case of Lou's complaint to uh, Mr. Murdoch, I don't think it was, but he, he was ignored. But there you are. That's, that's the principle. Um, what can you get if you do pursue through legal remedies? You can get an injunction to stop any further use. You can get damages or an account of profits. In other words, all the profits that the, uh, the unlawful infringer has made, you can claim those. You can get an order that um, the service provider takes it down off the website and gives you information about the infringer. However, or that may be very good, but in principle, the costs of legal action may be prohibitive. We can talk more about that a bit later if, if people are interested, but it, it may cost an awful lot. It may not be possible to identify who the infringer was. There's an awful lot of anonymous material put up there. Who knows who, who, where it came from? If it's passed through several hands, as this did, where did the infringement, who was the original infringer, were the subsequent ones secondary and therefore um, not liable for damages because they were entirely innocent. Um, this is all something which has to be looked into and it is another reason for perhaps trying to sort things out without recourse to law, albeit by that you know what the law is in the first place. Um, if you lose, you've got the liability for paying the other side's costs. Okay. I just wonder whether we should um, try and revisit this at the end when we've yeah. tried to broaden it out a little bit. Fine. Might, there might be some other uh, elements to talk about. But uh, unless you've got, what have you? Uh, no. Well, that was more or less yeah, as yeah. I got to there. Um, yeah, I've said there it may be possible to obtain uh, uh, an acceptable solution without going to court. Very often it can. <laughs> Not always. And then we need to look at how you can protect yourself on costs. How you can get somebody. How you can get the finance to to go to court if you really need to. But um, let's try and do it without first. Very useful. Okay. Very good. I see a lot of note taking there as well, so I think that's really practical information. So um, I think we should try and broaden it out now with Kate and Jamie. And I suppose um, before I talk to Jamie about <coughs> your experience in music as well and how we avoid any pitfalls there with rights um, and to sort of get your opinion on um, how people don't need to be scared. But Kate, I suppose how would you avoid or uh, being, you know, being in multi-platform um, has this happened, or how would you avoid a Mammoths Live happening to you? Mammoths Live. Um, so, I mean, the most important thing kind of to mention really from our perspective as a broadcaster, we do use a lot of UGC in our programmes. Fox's Live that we've just finished was a, a great example of that. We had 20,000 people posting sightings on the website of Fox's. And lots of those were video postings. And so people posted content of foxes that they, they shot in their garden. Um, and when we solicit for content like that, they basically tick a terms and conditions box which says that we can use it and it may be featured as part of the broadcast program. Uh, if we ever come across anything on YouTube that we would like to use in the program, I mean, this kind of thing happened on, well, quick turnaround shows. I worked on Big Brother for years. We had a daily show. Sometimes we would come across stuff that we wanted to feature. We'd always get in touch with the person that uploaded that content and ask for their consent before we go ahead and do it. Uh, so, yeah, we, I mean, we always have that dialogue with the content creators. Yeah, and do you have any... Are there any sort of uh, tips for these guys here to sort of say, well, um, you know, these are the sort of... Uh, this is how to manage it or um, to prevent your stuff being ripped off. I mean, you haven't been ripped off yet. You don't feel as though you've, you've had anything that's, uh, that's already been ripped off from someone else. Uh, across the Channel 4 slate? Yeah, across the stuff that you've commissioned. So well, I mean, that, like, it happens all the time that people kind of upload Channel 4 content that they rip either yeah. from online or they rip even from the telly. People sit there and literally just shoot the telly and then <laughs> upload it. Um, but that is one of the benefits of us having a relationship with YouTube and we have a partnership with YouTube and for every clip that we upload to YouTube, it fingerprints all the Channel 4 content and then it crawls all of YouTube and this is a continuous process, keeps crawling, crawling, crawling and it automatically takes down copies of our content. Um, so that is a, a huge benefit for us, having that relationship Great. with YouTube. Great, I'm glad, glad you mentioned YouTube because that, that leads in nicely to Jamie. So, I mean, your, um, and the, the, uh, the watermarking on digital fingerprinting, I mean, is there, 
What yeah, so, um, so just to give you um, my background, so I work for a company called Base79, um, we formed in 2008 and essentially our role is to work with rights holders to help them uh, manage, um, control and monetize uh, their content online. Uh, most online viewing is done on YouTube, so um, we're a kind of de facto um, you know, YouTube uh, partner and, uh, you know, we, we kind of work with rights holders to navigate that platform. So, um, I mean, our view of the world is that um, YouTube um, sort of have these tools available um, with digital f fingerprinting, <coughs> as, as Kate mentioned. They have um, content ID, uh, video ID and audio ID um, available to, you know, sort of video and audio. Um, and, you know, we, it, it is complicated and, you know, we, we help rights holders um, on, that, on that journey to make sure that, you know, whatever their policy is, we can kind of um, work on that for them. So, you know, it might be that you choose to block all of that content, all of that UGC content or, you know, or unauthorised content or you could actually claim it as well, you know, so you can actually monetize it. Um, I think the other thing to note is with YouTube, um, with this kind of sort of scenario happening, that when you upload a video to YouTube, um, it only um, commercialises if you actually claim the right. So, so you, you upload it, you sort of claim in the T's and C's, you have to manually claim that you own the copyright to this. Um, and that is when, you know, the advertising and the monetization starts there. So, you know, Unless you do that, you know, you've got lots of content on there that you can choose to monetize or take down. But, you know, really, you know, if you get the scenario where someone's uploaded... So say I uploaded content and it's digitally fingerprinted and someone uploads the same content and they put a claim on it, what you have there is a conflict. Um, and, you know, again, at the sort of one extreme, you know, it take, takes a judge to kind of decide who owns the copyright. But, you know, you, we sort of settle that for our rights holders by, you know, contacting <coughs> the rights holder and, um, and having, uh, having those kind of um, conversations. I think people assume, don't they, that YouTube is a big scary beast that they can't possibly have any contact with and uh, is going to be impossible to contact if they ever do have any dispute. I think that... Can I just a, no, <coughs> come in there? Because I think the digital fingerprinting has been really helpful for a lot of um, content owners and people that own copyright. Um, YouTube, I was saying before, is like a... Um, a small keep inside a castle with 10,000 foot walls. There is a ring. YouTube policy really seems to be that they'll reach out to people that they want to partner with, but they do make it quite difficult to um, get in contact, even for companies the size that I run, um, unless you go through um, hallowed entrances. Um, so one of those entrances would be Jamie's company. Um, but it's quite interesting because I think um, it's at least 30 hours of footage is uploaded to YouTube every minute. So they have no way of controlling um, what's actually appearing on their site. 72 so now. 72 <laughs> hours yeah. a minute. So essentially they rely on technology which, uh, to, to filter things like nudity, obscenity and everything else. And they've developed some great um, tools for that. However, it doesn't always work. We had a legal claim last week from his, an Israeli scientist um, who was complaining against our company for... Um, in, for putting a copyright claim against a video that he'd put up rather like Lou's. Uh, he was, um, uh, worked in medicine and wanted to respond to some news items about his product and had put up a, his own video statement. And YouTube had, d had blocked his video because it said that we'd complained about it. Um, and what it seems is they, they um, now use keywords that you write in the description to block video copyright as well as video matching and audio matching and so it shows that technology is never quite accurate and I got a legal letter telling us that we had to pay hundreds of thousands of dollars overnight otherwise uh, <laughs> actions would start for blocking an Israeli scientist's um, vlog which was all a bit mystifying until we worked the video. Okay, yeah, yeah. Right, yeah. and uh, so technology is solving a lot of problems for us we used to have our videos mercilessly ripped as Channel 4 still I'm sure has on a daily basis and um, it's been able to really make YouTube a, a help rather than a hindrance to us um, a lot with a lot of what they do. And also a absolutely. Sorry, Sorry. You No, know, it's just, uh, just to reiterate, it is a huge benefit because I remember, <coughs> I mean, we launched Channel 4 on YouTube in 2008 and I remember part of the job of actually kind of managing YouTube at that stage was 
collecting all the URLs of copies of our content because it was a manual process. And you can imagine, can you just, I mean, you sit there and search Channel 4 skins, you kind of just shameless searching brands to just for this illegal content to come up and then you'd literally, we'd be doing a manual process of sourcing all these URLs. Then we'd write a letter to YouTube, our lawyers would write a letter to YouTube and everything. And it's crazy that kind of in that very short space of time, now it's just, it's brilliant that we don't have to do that anymore and it's an automatic process. I was going to add to that, I mean, the advantage of um, sort of understanding the platform and, and, and being on there and using these tools is that you can actually drive official viewing. So, you know, you stop people searching on uh, YouTube uh, for, for the content that you, that you own and looking at it elsewhere. So if it's in your official channel, you generate the advertising revenue from it. And, you know, it's actually a, um, you know, a huge commercial opportunity. Um, and... Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, and companies like Base79, you know, we work to kind of, uh, we sell advertising around content on, on official channels. So, you know, that's how we can uh, add value to the rights holder. And I think that ad funded revenue stream is, is really the opportunity for the rights holder here. It's an opportunity, but I think until it starts, until the numbers start to really stack up against what broadcasters are getting for the same number of eyeballs, um, mm. I think there's a, a real problem still uh, because the internet and to internet stream television will be how we're all watching television in five to ten years yeah. time but it's very important that the advertisers um, don't uh, continue to pay such low rates for online um, because it won't sustain <coughs> the production values that uh, broadcasters like Channel 4 bring yeah. to the, the so viewer. I mean, that's right, so do you think 4OD and iPlayer, are, because they are I, mean, I know this is a sort of side, a side issue, do you think they are, because they're not they're only monetized by advertising. There's no subscription involved. Yeah. Is that um, do, they, do we need to do some backpedaling here to try and get it to an issue where they are? There is more money involved because you know um, <coughs> it's fairly cheap at the moment, isn't it? And it's yeah, the advertisers are getting those eyeballs for a low rate. Yeah, and it's difficult to backpedal from that spot mm. really. But so I mean, for us as broadcaster, that's why ultimately we we. Put more of you know we have all our own content on our own platform where of course you, you know you make more money on it um mm. so so as a broadcaster yeah we'd, we'd much prefer everybody probably to kind of watch everything on our own platform but you go to where the audience is which is on youtube i mean the young audience is on youtube and yeah. and it, it, it we're not just there to monetize we're not mm. just there to make money it's about going to where the audience is and it's about kind of marketing and PR and you want to be there in that pool you've got to be there so yeah yeah so you may as well be there rather than be ripped off and yeah I mean, my, my view on it is um, you know it's well it's all incremental revenue um, anyway but you know in terms of how it's monetized you know they it is expensive to advertise in 4OD you know an ITV player and um and you know, base seventy nine. You know, it's it's more expensive because it's kind of targeted, high quality TV content. So at scale, it does work those kind of models. But you know, it's kind of you have to think about YouTube a little bit differently. And sort of Kate mentioned there, you know, there are you know it does over index with younger male people. Um, you know, the content it's it's all it's very much social content. You know, the the clips are shorter. There's different kind of frequencies and schedules. You have to think about that content differently. And people who are you know, so people at SBTV, the example Kate brought up yesterday when we were discussing this, you know, they are producers and they have formats that exist only on YouTube. And so who is this? SB, SB SBTV, yeah, yeah. Jamal Edwards, who is the sort of <coughs> face of, um, you know, Google Chrome and YouTube. So he's a young entrepreneur. Um, and, you know, his business model is, is ad funded revenue and then the sort of different sort of sponsorship that co can kind of come from that. So, um, so yeah, I think it works at scale. You know, it's, it is completely different to... Um, traditional um, sort of broadcast um, um, models and, um, and distribution models, but um, but yeah, at the moment it's incremental. But you know, we need to sort of uh, work away. You know, and we and I sort of firmly believe that there is a way for that to be a, a sort of integral part of a, a business model. And production outfits like SBTV can survive on that model and flourish on that model because their production values aren't very high. It's very cheap to create the content that they make. Um, and so, yeah, they can totally sustain and flourish in that territory. But I think, I, I think there is absolutely an appreciation of. I mean, there's no way that you could kind of SBTV could be making high-end drama and putting it on YouTube yeah. and yeah. and it yeah. working. 
Hey, what? Go on, sorry, Sam. No, I was just going to say, I think what YouTube does offer, and Vimeo as well, and other um, similar things, um, is a wonderful platform for young creatives in, in exactly the way that SBTV has done it, to uh, be able to um, show the world what they're doing. Um, but also, it, the commercialization of YouTube is giving um, a wage to people who do that, because um, one of our apprentices um, got his apprenticeship with us because he shot um, music videos on his phone and put them onto YouTube, you know, and so he's now worked on a number of different films, he's 21, you know, he didn't have proper education, so I think that um, the, the issue coming all the way around is that <coughs> YouTube is actually now, from being the big beast in the room, is now giving these people opportunities to um, fund their work, even if it's through slightly different ways, and is giving people the ability to protect the copyright around their work if you can <coughs> tickle the boxes and understand the system in a good way. So that's, that's very positive, isn't it? I mean, I think, um, so, you know, the, for, for Barcroft Media, I suppose, this, the young kids doing their short little clips are then the ones that are making Boy Call Fish, um, uh, you know. Yeah, I mean, he was on that crew, actually. But yeah. I, think, um, I think what it means is, uh, my view is young creatives, whether uh, grow into old creatives, you know, they're, <laughs> they're the same people that... Yeah. Um, uh, uh, do in the auditions for The Voice um, will be the same people that will be singing in 20 years' time. And I think that um, people like Channel 4 and the BBC do good work around young filmmakers, um, and especially places like Sheffield. Um, but some, for some of them that can't quite understand the way of getting into these type of environments, things like YouTube and Vimeo are a godsend. Um, most A&R for record companies is now done um, online. They don't bother going to gigs anymore. Really? They just uh, listen to Facebook and MySpace. So it is wonderfully empowering, but the, the, the secret is people have to understand the tricks. And if you're a production company or a producer that has your content, uh, rather than shying away from things like YouTube, you can use the digital fingerprinting without actually publishing your video. So what you can do is get your content up there and mark it as private, um, claim the copyright on it, and you don't even have to have it viewable to the public, which is uh, something that we do all the time to stop people um, uh, posting our material once it's um, yeah. out in the ether. Um, so there is some control methods you can use like that. That, that, that is, is, is very good. And the digital fingerprinting and other technology certainly helps. It makes life easier for uh, people like YouTube and it will prevent a lot of problems in the future. But that is particularly going to be effective when there's uh, material that has originated from Channel 4 or some other. Um, major concern, but if if some if an individual goes along, as you say, Sam, and puts something on on YouTube, marks it with his uh, copyright notice, because uh, the, the, a digital fingerprint is really it's just the same as putting like the traditional little copyright C in the circle on something. Anybody can put that on. It doesn't give you copyright. It doesn't mean you've got copyright. It creates a presumption that you have until somebody rebuts that presumption. So somebody might well mark it as something as his, which actually doesn't belong to him. Now, how is YouTube going to know? There's no technology in the world is ever going to know that that copyright actually did belong to the, the person who, who puts it up there. It could belong to anybody else. And it's, it's, it's going to be impossible virtually with the amount of material for YouTube to know. In law, that's correct. But in practice, um, the internet's all about first origination. So um, if you're the first person to upload an episode of Skins to YouTube and mark it as if you're private, the first person you're probably working for Channel yeah. 4 and, uh, because you've got the tape before anybody else has. So it's just a, a, a clever method for people that are about to put their documentary online or to put some footage up like Lou did um, of a river um, as a, as, uh, for whatever reason. You can do it without having to publish your work online through YouTube. You pop, you pop it, you mm. register on YouTube, you pop your film up there, you mark it as yours, and you, can, and you can tell them that you don't want it published, which means nobody can find it or see it in YouTube. Yet if somebody else tries physically to upload that clip, um, they'll, they won't be able to. Yeah, it's great advice. Well, that is great. And, and it's, you should always do that, just the same as you should always, on, on any printed material, put a little C on it. It, it gives a presumption. It's, it gives you, um, uh, gives you a step, step up on the others. Anybody mm. trying to copy? Sorry, Lou, you were good. No, I was just going to say, um, in, in this case, what can you do after the case? 
um, like the stolen footage got stolen and people used AdSense on it. And if you throw up a, if you could have the, uh, the I'll just, um, the, the river footage um, eventually, like before, oh yeah, by the way, I got hacked. Um, I got to a point where after 22 years of having an email account, somebody hacked me, got rid of my uh, YouTube channel, tried to hack my Skype and got rid of my account. Um, but anyway. You must have walked under a ladder. I was, that yeah. was not a good day. No. But before, before, so, uh, but just before that, I, that river footage hit 380,000 hits and um, the Code Mammoth article went to, uh, I think, 185 countries. So it did quite well. But people were taking that footage and just do, YouTube were very quick in taking stuff down, by the way. Like within, within a few days, they took stuff down. But that river footage, I did use AdSense for the last um, 10 days and, oops, and it got nearly 8,000, that's 10 days, it was about nearly 8,000 hits and I got seven bucks. So I kind of figured for every thousand hit, there was about one dollar and, oops, and then I reckon there was about a minimum of seven million hits. So that's about seven thousand dollars that was generated through, I imagine, AdSense through Google and the people who put that video up got, got that amount. I guess what I'm struggling with now is what happens with, and I've been trying to get How to YouTube. How much did the you best, get? Well, the best yes. thing that I got from YouTube, I've tried for ages, tried to get them here, um, uh, tried uh, copyright YouTube in UK, Australia, and um, America. I did get an email the other week from the California Google department, which basically said, take, me to, take us to court if you have a problem. <laughs> And I guess, is that, is that the thing? Is that well, in this case, yeah, if, if they're big and powerful, they can just say, well, OK, we're here. If you, if you want to come and get us, come and get us. You, you, you take the action. Um, but in, in principle, if you are prepared to do that, then you are entitled to your loss of profits on, on what you might have made or an account of their profits. So if they've, somebody has made a lot of profits from advertising revenue associated with the infringement, you are entitled to all of that advertising revenue, which, which could be enormous. So in principle, you're entitled to all of that in the law. That's under English law. It's much the same in, in other countries. You can claim in England using English law for infringements in a lot of other countries in the world. There's, there's international treaties and conventions which cover most of the world. Uh, and so you, you can get that. The problem is how do you finance actually taking that action if you've got a big corporation you, you're faced with who just doesn't respond to your letters? Well, there are various ways. Um, you, you can, um, a lot of, some lawyers will work for you on a conditional fee so you don't, get, don't pay if they lose, you pay more if they win. Uh, you can get um, insurance after the event insurance which will cover any possibility of having to pay the other side's costs if you lose. Um, if you take the action in the right court, it's called the Patents County Court in England, which is a bit of a misnomer, but that's what it's called. The costs are relatively very low, and it's very quick to get to a judgment as well. So that's, uh, that's why that, in that Everest case, they, they brought the action, even though it was partly in Nepal and partly in Denmark, they, they brought the action in England because it was quicker and cheaper. Alternatively, if you go to the United States, although that's probably the most expensive jurisdiction in the world for legal costs, you can get lawyers there who will act for you on a contingency basis. And so a lot of people will take up actions that nobody else in the world would touch. Their contingency means that the, the lawyer is entitled to take a proportion of your winnings, which might be 50% or, or whatever. Now, that's not legal in, in this country. It can't be done. But in, in, uh, in the United States it can, so it could be that if you can find the right lawyer there, that is the jurisdiction to can take I, can action. I, can I mention a case in point on that just on a still? It's quite interesting, um, a chap during the Haiti earthquake uploaded the first pictures um, onto Twitter and tweeted about it, and a um, company called Agence France Press, which is the French press agency, decided to use that picture and to circulate it around the world on their wire, knowing that it had been taken from Twitter. Uh, that's been rumbling through the courts for a couple of years now in the US and the legal bills are in the tens of millions of dollars and it shows <laughs> that um, even if you're somebody um, in Haiti um, who's had an experience like that, 
they're, they're in the US courts, there's so much money in the litigation that you can find ways of fighting it and, and against very big companies. But the, the individual who put it onto Twitter, though, how did he, how has he managed to, to fund keep that? this? I'm, no, I'm not entirely sure, basis. but I would imagine okay. it would yeah. be on some kind of um, aggressive lawyer basis. But um, mm -hmm. it does show that whoever you are, you have to stand up for yourselves. And if you do, you generally get a result because we find, we, we talk to companies every day of the week um, who inadvertently or advertently borrow our copyright. Um, and um, we find they settle almost immediately every single time. And what we do is we take a practical view on this, a little bit the way that Kate was saying, there are certain people that you just have to go after and make sure it doesn't happen, mostly for two different reasons. One is financial um, and one is reputation based. So um, Michael probably went after his case for both of those reasons. Um, but um, we find that there's a really important thing to do. So if you have a documentary that's just about to air or just has aired and you find a number of different people have taken something from it or taken frames or, or misrepresented it, the most important thing to do is triage it and say, okay, well, I can't respond to 10,000 things in, in Lou's case even more. Which ones am I going to go after? And our way of dealing with it is we make a list and we put the people that m should know better and can afford to pay for content at the top of that list and we go after them very quickly and clearly and they will always pay you. Um, and then secondly, we put the ones that might be in a bedroom in Wyoming but have misrepresented the content or made it... Um, or doing something damaging second on the list uh, because it's very important to keep the integrity of work. And actually the ISPs, in our experience, will very quickly take material down as well. So mm -hmm. I think that uh, in the West Wing series one, they said that civil rights was the movement of the uh, 60s and 70s, but privacy is going to be the movement of the, uh, of the next decade. And I think copyright comes into privacy quite, uh, quite heavily. And, um, and I think that there's a big... Uh, big opportunity for people now to, to robustly protect their copyright and actually we see it as a money earner. If people steal our material and use it badly, we charge them a lot of money and um, get paid and, and, re and recompense the people. It's a revenue stream. Can be if you're clever about it and efficient. Can be on YouTube as well. Yeah. Yeah. It's always worth having a go as well because as you say, Sam, very often, in, in nine, eight or nine cases out of ten, if you get a really strong solicitor's letter, a letter before action, threatening action, the other side, the, the infringer, will, will cave in and will come and settle. I mean, in some cases they're big and powerful and they don't want to know you and they won't. But in, in or, they, or they're just plain bloody awkward and they won't. But in, in a large proportion of cases, they will actually give you something. And the cost of preparing the case and writing to them is pretty small. It's, it, it's, you're, you're talking about a few hundred or maybe a few thousand pounds, not, not a fortune, and you've got a good chance of, of getting something for it. But you're, I mean, you're, sorry, Jamie, you were about to... No, 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 I was... Uh, um, no, no, it's fine, I didn't... No, I was going to say, because Apple, um, a production company in Australia recently sued Apple, um, friends of mine, that Nick Murray at Cordell Jigsaw. He's a, he happens to be a lawyer, so it does help, but it was, uh, it was an app that was created called Chopper Soundboard. It was a comedy app, which became number one, I think, and he uh, found just happened to see a brief clip of one of his old comedies from a few years earlier. And he got his teeth into Apple. He, um, you know, he said it was a bit like trying to contact a faceless company. There was no Apple in Australia, for example. And uh, it sounded slightly X-Files-ish, but he ran up big legal, big legal bills. He said he, he spoke to his wife one night, and uh, she said, how's it going with the Apple case? He said, uh, you better sit down. And, she, and uh, she said, well, how much is it? He said, uh, $150,000. And she then split in a bit of Anglo-Saxon and said, well, F, you better make sure you bloody well take him to the cleaners then. And um, he won. He won, and it was out recently. He, uh, um, he got his money back and a lot more, and he won't tell me how much, but he said I was able to take the office out for a good drink afterwards. So uh, it just shows you, I mean, that there's, you have to be slightly on the, I suppose, on the mad side of persistent to do it, as you say. I but think you you've can just do got it. To, you, yeah. you, if you know you've got a case, you've got to fight it. And yeah. one thing I would say is... The broadcasters in the UK are very, very good when you're in production management about clearing every second of audio and, um, and everything else. And it's just really important to say we've all got to be careful not to feel that everybody's out to knock us the whole time as independent producers. And if you are, uh, you know, 
who knew that Happy Birthday was copyright until it was in the last <laughs> bit of a Nat Geo special for us last month and we had to tug it. They make millions of dollars every year chasing their copyright on oh, Happy Birthday. Yeah. Yeah. That is that's fantastic. Spoiled the end of my last Nat Geo <laughs> special. But, uh, <laughs> Just uh, before we take Alistair, sorry, I was, uh, I was about to say, so YouTube as a, as a broadcaster, one of, the, one of the points of this was to try and present, it's not a bit, you know, they're not a big bad thing out there, there are worse things and that, that castle keep analogy was very good of Sam. So. There are other operators out there who have a lot less scruples, and you're very close to YouTube, Jamie, and as a broadcaster, you work closely to them. So there's, there's a lot of reassurances uh, to be given to people, isn't there, what's left of the audience? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, it's, um, you know, even if you're, um, you're on there just to kind of, um, you know, keep an eye on your content, you know, as I've mentioned, it's a huge com commercial opportunity. You know, you can, um, you know, it, it does require resource and, you know, Channel 4 have teams, but um, Barcroft's currently, you know, managing it in-house, but it can be complicated. That's why we exist, to help rights holders kind of settle these kind of claims on the platform. Um, and, you know, this is where a lot of your kind of copyright issues will kind of crop up on YouTube. Um, and, you know, the, there's tools there um, and, and a, a good sort of system in place to sort of manage that robustly. Um, you know, I think it's it's more the, you know, in terms of copyright, it's the kind of, you, you know, your sort of uh, malicious uh, copyright infringers, you know, like your pirate bays and things like that, that are, you know, probably much more of a concern to rights holders on the web, I would say. Just to say as well, it's actually, it's not, it's not all bad when people rip your content as well. It's just good to highlight. There are some examples, well, we've had a few along the way where people rip your content and actually create something quite brilliant with it. <laughs> And then you're left with this like, oh, and it's doing really well, and loads of people are watching it, and it's, yeah. and it is actually, you know, I, I'm absolutely yeah. not telling people to do this <laughs> by any means, and unfortunately we, we often end up in a spot where we do take it down, but there was a recent example in Docs, actually, uh, we had a documentary on, it was about bouncers in Newport, three episodes, and Goldie Looking Chain, they're from there. And Newport. they, the band, yeah. you up? Newport. Newport. Yeah. Um, and they uh, took the dock, did a cut, wrote a track, and put this video up on YouTube. And it was quite brilliant. Yeah. And everybody was watching it. And it was doing a good job for the show as well, you know, because loads of people were watching it and they were like, wow, what's this documentary about bouncers in Newport? <laughs> and in the end, we did unfortunately have to take that down. But it, we took it down not not primarily for copyright reasons, it was it was for the contributors, because the contributors who were actually in the documentary weren't happy with, you know, I mean, the cut that they'd done, and they were kind of taking clips of people and, and repeating it 10 times, and so, yeah. so we yeah. took it down for the contributors, but there was obviously an interesting copyright discussion to be had there. They did it to Jay-Z and Alicia Keys as well, didn't yeah, they? they did. Goldie looking chain with New York, yeah. Newport, it was a bit of brilliant genius, yeah. but they had, yeah. that had to be pulled as well. Yeah. The problem is, in these days, kids are being asked by CBBC and other channels to do mashups. you know, yeah, yeah, part yeah. of the creative landscape, it's yeah. like the modern collage. Remember in school, we had to rip up a magazine and stick yeah. it onto yeah. a bit of wallpaper the modern digital age mm. what you do is take a bit of footage and take a bit of audio and work with it yeah. we work with the last government to try and say look we need to educate kids the kids don't understand copyright they have no idea you know because on one hand the school is saying be creative around media and the other hand they're saying you're not allowed to touch that and, and they're creating their own IP all the time exactly well. and, and it does create massive buzz around our shows and, and keeps the yeah. eyeballs coming back into the originator that's the whole yeah. thinking behind it but it's, it's a real difficult tightrope for everyone, you know. And formalising mashups kind of takes the spirit out of it a bit. Because yeah, um, right. uh, we have kind of gone down that route. Well, a project on Big Brother, we were kind of, we dealt with the lawyers and we were like, how about we actually release um, kind of, you know, scraps of this little kind of toolkit that people then can use to create mashups. And it was all above board and you could do it. But to be honest, anyone that's cutting mashups doesn't want a yeah. kind of ordained, certified little toolkit that so they're allowed to use. We work with loads of um, YouTubers who are the people that we call, uh, you know, the original creators on YouTube that make a living from it. And, you know, they do all kinds of things like mashups of computer games where they rap over it and put the lyrics up and things. Also work with loads of athletes, free runners and things like that. And, you know, those guys, you know, want clips and they want, 
music that are kind of cleared so they can kind of make money from what they're doing without having any rights issues. And conversely, actually, the, the rights holders there, so the labels that we, uh, that we represent and, you know, some of the, um, the sort of clips galleries and, um, and rights holders there, you know, actually want this kind of content disseminated in the web in a legal way. So, so you know, Base79 can claim all of that stuff on their behalf and generate their mad funded revenue. So, you know, I think it is a really good point that having, you know, that kind of mashup content out there in a, in a way that's kind of managed and there's an agreement in place is actually a, a win for both parties. But it shows you in the future that this, we're going to have to be a bit more relaxed about it is what you're saying because if that's the way people are starting to make content then um, it, can't, it can't be as defensive in the future because you can't possibly stop the floodgates it's about clever, using technology cleverly, which YouTube have started to do, having a spirit of adventure and trying to cleverly find ways to make sure that if somebody's gone all the way to Siberia to, to fulfil a, po a project that's very close to their heart and very important to them, that they don't feel they've been turned over and that they get the money that they deserve from that. And I think that that's the challenge coming up, is how do you keep this creative spirit and fires burning in people and the new wave of young pirate bayers in Sweden feel that copyright is there to be um, abused in a way. Well, who's to say that there's not a clever way that, as Jamie intimates, we, we find clever ways to make content available, but to make sure that people that originated get a share of whatever comes from it. Well, collecting societies is, is one of the ways. I can't see quite how it would work here, but I mean, that's what's used in, in all sorts of other areas of copyright, isn't it? You have collecting societies which bring in the money and then people can go and perform songs or, or yeah. whatever uh, without having to worry about it. Yeah. And they have, obviously, uh, royalties from online video and audio as well. Yeah, I mean, this is something which is being discussed in Parliament at the present moment uh, in, under the, uh, the Enterprise Bill. Collecting societies is something which is very much in that, and it's not been decided yet how they will work. But, well, well, we already have them, but just how they will be extended. But it was part also of the, the Hargreaves report on, on IP uh, a year or two ago that th that should be extended. And uh, there's, there's also a whole other area of orphan works as well, which, um, you know, works that nobody knows who was the creator of and how do you get any rights to use that? Are you, suppose you use one of those and then somebody who created it pops up um, out of the blue sometime later after you've made millions of pounds out of it. So there's, that, there's a lot of that to be They done. are areas, of the international scope of, of copyright is challenging. Australia has a fair use law, mm. which is very difficult because we produce content that goes up on YouTube and then we see it on Good Morning Australia the next day. They run it six times in two hours, <laughs> uh, break our exclusive all around the world. And then when we talk to their lawyers and say, listen, that you know who was a copyright holder of that because it was all clearly marked and everything else, they say, well, we refer you to the Australian Fair Use Law, which says, essentially, if you're trying to cover news, you're allowed to use material and not pay for it. And um, so it can be very tough. There's been a number of big actions in Australia against the broadcasters, and they've spent many, many millions of dollars defending that. And Orphan Works, unfortunately, has the scope to become another one of those things yeah. where <laughs> somebody can steal our work and um, claim they didn't know whose it was. And, and I think that that is a bit of a problem. I think technology joining up with um, creatives is the way to solve this problem. Okay. Clever ways of monitoring yeah. everything and making sure everyone gets their slice, even if it's just a couple of cents here and a couple of cents there, is probably the way to, uh, to solve it going forward. Yeah, bit by bit. So I suppose we should try and take some questions mm. and then maybe um, carry on that conversation. If, uh, th thanks for waiting, Alistair. Thanks. Uh, my name's Alistair White from British Pathé. Um, the conversation has moved a little bit on from when I first got the microphone in my hand, actually. Uh, but I wanted to, uh, the, the elephant in the room, or should I say the hairy mammoth in the room, <laughs> is the Hargreaves report, which is, uh, um, uh, which is a recommendation to government to uh, relax and change the uh, laws on copyright, and um, which could have a radical effect on the discussions that we're having here. And I wonder if if you could comment on that, Stuart, isn't it, I think? It is, yes. Uh, if you could comment on the changes to the uh, IP with regard to the Hargreaves report, if it is pushed through Parliament. And, um, uh, and also, if we could sort of discuss the likely Im implications on, our, on the businesses that we're in. 
uh, particularly the archive and the... I mean, as far as I understand it, uh, your hairy mammoth story, um, if the Hargreaves recommendation goes through Parliament, then they will... The person who put, took your bit of footage will be able to take it legally. And we'll be able to make another bit of another film and be able to put it uh, and be able to monetize it without any, without giving any money back to yourself. Okay, well, let's answer that one, knowing that we probably need another question if we have for yeah. the end as well. But is, yeah. is that one for you, Stuart? Uh, yeah, uh, just very, very briefly. The, the Hargreaves report, of course, covered all aspects of IP, patents, uh, and everything. But on, on the question of, of copyright, it was looking particularly, as you say, at extending what we might call fair use. Um, lawfully. Now, there's already lots of provisions that permit people fair use. There's fair use reporting for, uh, for the purpose of reporting news, so long as the, the amount is taken is small and um, uh, the, there is attribution given. There, there is um, a fair use uh, for research. Um, there is use for personal use um, that, that is non-commercial. Um, copies can be made then uh, there. Uh, for judicial and regulatory and parliamentary purposes, copies can be made. So there's all sorts of defences already uh, and exceptions. Now, certainly the, the suggestion was made in that report and Parliament is considering it at present. I'm, I'm really not sure quite how it's going to go. But to, to extend those to possibly something like... Um, Sam was talking about that they have in Australia. And uh, it does appear that it's going to go, be going rather f too far. But on, on the other hand, at, at present, um, it, you may think that it's a little too restrictive. And there, there was a big decision recently which said that um, even uh, using headlines, reporting headlines from a newspaper was an infringement of copyright in tho those headlines. Now, you'd have thought that if somebody was uh, providing a service to... Um, give people uh, the, the news from the headlines, that would be something that wasn't actually infringing the copyright, but it was said that it was. So perhaps there needs to be some relaxation, but clearly we have got to be very careful that we're not going to allow people to make whatever use they want to of material that's out there without having to uh, pay for any licence. Again, another way of doing this is perhaps to tie it in with some sort of um, collecting Service that sort of licensed collecting society. I, I'm, I'm not sure, so sure on that. Oh, that's good. Okay. Is that Alistair? You're pretty happy with that? It's extremely complicated issues. I mean, I would recommend that anyone who's interested in this, and I think we all should be actually, to go on the Focal website and to uh, there's an information sheet on there that sort of explains the likely changes to copyright that the Hargreaves report is recommending. And yeah, this Focal would being the, the clip yeah. specialists. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, the yeah, archive. Yeah. Um, the Archive uh, uh, Association, okay, it, well. Focal International. Right, but this okay. could go through Parliament in the next I mean, th that does months. also cover the orphan uh, it does, works as it well, does very much, doesn't it? Well. We could probably speak if Focal um, support that, actually. Yeah. Okay. Uh, it's more to do with the, co the extension of the exceptions to copyright yes, yeah. that is the issue. Okay. I can understand. Um, any other questions? Any all those people that are. Here we go. It does. Oh. Yeah. Um, as a producer... Sorry, Nate, Nate, if you don't mind introducing yourself, sorry. Um, so. Sophie Jackson, I'm an independent producer. Um, m my heart is obviously with the producers and content creation and, and all of that kind of stuff, but I just throw out a question, you know. Uh, the, you're kind of chasing, chasing the copyright infringement and finding ways to... Uh, you know, protect what used to stand as copyright. I just wonder whether the whole concept of copyright is dead. Um, do you need to look at it in an entirely different way? I mean, in fi even five years' time, is it going to be a completely different landscape as well? Mm. You know, I just wonder whether there needs to be a completely different I um, think so. What Sam was, I think Sam was just about... You were sort of getting that way, weren't you, just now? He was well, I think if you look at countries like China, um, they, they do have a totally different view on copyright than um, we would in a lot of other places. And obviously China is going to be a, a, a kind of business leading and um, a leading part of the globe in the next 100 years. And um, uh, they have much less uh, uh, of a kind of strict view about 
uh, the rights of people who create content to continue monetizing that going forward. I think the issue is uh, platforms. So I think the, the reality is that I think broadcasters will still continue to be able to make money because they're, they're the originators. I think origination and the first show of anything is going to become all important. The so exclusive I, first yeah, I think it's all about the first moment. That I think money will move to that first moment. And I think after that, yes, there may well be an issue that copyright in terms of the concept that you should be able to get $2 out of your film showing in 50 years' time... I think is definitely factoring, um, unfortunately, for people who make a living from it. And I think people will have to probably accept as producers that it's about the first show and it's about the first airing. And I think uh, deals with broadcasters seem to be representing the fact they want to buy out rights much That's more. That's happening now. Uh, yeah, we, we, we're signing a lot of deals with Discovery where Discovery they just actually. won't won't allow you any rights and no. in a way it's quite refreshing because you just have to accept it and get on with making great programs. Well not from my perspective as a rights exploiter I, I think it's, uh, it's tricky but I think rights fragmentation after the effect yeah it's good but the Nat Geo's and Discoveries want to, to rena- retain exclusivity for their platforms don't they to get strength to get their subscriber base up it's all about that isn't it but which brings it all around to a more general level so is that, is that okay Sophie if you're happy with that answer? I just throw it into the air, really. No, okay. <laughs> I think Sweden as well, with Pirate Bay becoming a legitimate political movement, you ignore that at your peril. You know, yeah. it might seem ridiculous, but actually, it's a, Sweden's a very forward-thinking society, and um, and if that's come up, everybody has to listen um, because whether we like it or not, if that's the um, if that's the next generation telling us how they see the world, we have to listen. And I think um, I think that. Creatives just need to concentrate on creating and um, rights managers need to realise, unfortunately, that the rights at the front end are what's now going to be very, very important um, and, uh, and the archive rights that once were there, pictures, it was my original business, stills, stills aren't worth anything anymore. They literally are worth nothing, although they have great power. Um, phys- financially, they're worth very, very little and, and unfortunately, I think footage will although it's still much richer as an archive um, material, will go the same way. So programming is what will be key in delivery. So content isn't necessarily key. I think um, Sophie's suggestion sounds incredibly radical that we we do away with copyright, but when you listen to the the very good points that Sam has made there, uh, and really, should we be thinking that copyright, making a a living in 50 years' time or, or longer, although some people are concerned with that, but for most jobs, you get paid for doing it. I mean, I get paid for doing my job. I don't expect to, to be paid in 20 or 30 years' time for the same work that I've done now. Uh, whereas somebody creating, uh, I'm, I'm probably being, going to be thrown out of here by <laughs> the, these other people on the panel. Um, <laughs> I, we have to, um, I've been given the, uh, the, uh, the slit throat uh, there, so we're, we're all out of time, and I think that was... I've learned a hell of a lot from, from these five people. Um, I don't know about the rest of you. So thank you very much. That was really, really interesting. Yeah. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for coming along. Thanks. Thanks.